Um, thank you for joining us today for the State of the Black Student Athlete in America. The Congressman, he's running just a little bit behind, but he'll be here shortly. Um, I'm Stephanie. I am the Communications Director for Congressman Lawson. A lot of our staff members are here as well. I don't have my glasses on, but I think they are in that corner back there. <laughs> Let's see. Um, I am not the moderator. We have Georgia, and so I'm going to introduce her, and then she will take it on from here. Cool? Cool. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, Georgia Dawkins, Dawkins is an award-winning author, producer, and journalist from Los Angeles to Atlanta. She has worked on national productions with BET and Entertainment One. Uh, Georgia, a graduate of Florida A&M University. Are there any other Rattlers in the house? Okay. HBCUs, we love y'all too. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, she got her start with Good Morning America in 2008. In 2016, the former local news producer seized the opportunity to help create and develop the national talk show Sister Circle Live. Since then, she has gone on to produce television content for millions of viewers around the nation. She has served as a television news producer in cities including Tallahassee, Fort Myers, Sh Shreveport, <laughs> Tampa, and yes. As the Chief Executive Officer of Georgia Dawkins Media, Georgia develops original programming while coaching others on how to break into production. Affectionately known as the Purpose Producer, the Rising Star is committed to empowering communities through media. Welcome, Georgia Dawkins. Hi, everybody. Oh, wow, you know, you guys aren't up yet. It's only, what, 1 o'clock, 1.30? Let's try it again. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Hi, I just want to really give a, a shout out to Stephanie Lambert because Stephanie actually gave me a big opportunity as a student journalist. Um, the year after I worked at Good Morning America for the first year, because they brought me back because HBCUs are great, you know. So uh, Stephanie and I were at an event with Shirley Ralph where she had a feature interview set up. And she turned to me right before her interview and she said, would you like to interview her? Uh, 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 no, <clears throat> no, I'm, I'm sick. I got asthma and stuff, and it's like bronchitis. I had all of the excuses, but none of them came out of my mouth. All I could say was yes, and that was a start for me. That really launched my career, not only in journalism but entertainment. So I'm so happy to be with you today. I bring you greetings from Atlanta, Georgia. I'm Georgia from Florida. I'm from Sebring. Has anybody ever heard of Sebring? Yeah. I got one. Okay, two. You heard of Sebring? Uh, heard that is so strange. <laughs> Population 10,000, 16% black. Everyone is my cousin. <laughs> so today you guys are my cousins. That's okay? We can be family today? Okay, because I'm really nervous. So uh, I was recently diagnosed with a bad case of athlete's foot. <sighs> Pray for me. So I'm going to introduce our panelists. I'm cured now, you guys. I'm cured. I'm in remission. Everybody's not cut out to be an athlete, okay? Some people are actually allergic to sweat. Isn't it amazing? So our first panelist today, affectionately known as Mama Durant, the real MVP. Wanda Durant is a strong leader, advocate, entrepreneur, philanthropist and philanthropists. Her passion is to inspire underserved children, single mothers, families, and communities to move beyond their immediate circumstances and to aim for higher heights in life. Ms. Durant is the mother of two-time NBA champion and MVP, MVP player, Kevin Durant. Did I say that right? Yes, I didn't mess it up? It's Kevin, right? Because yes. <laughs> he looked like you. He looked like you right up, right up in here. <laughs> Through her organization, Hope, Dream, Believe, and Achieve, Ms. Durant shares her blueprint for parenting that she used to help create her to help her children become successful adults. She also emphasizes to youth the importance of becoming global citizens and cultural diplomats and how to impact their communities. Ms. Durant uses her platform nationally and globally to inspire people to never quit and to always hope, dream, believe, and achieve. Please welcome Ms. Durant. Our next panelist is Timon Kyle Durrett. Durrett? Durrett. Okay. Durrett. Uh, Timon Kyle Durrett took Hollywood by storm with his staggering physique. Stand up. I'm just kidding. Sit down. <laughs> <laughs> We're family. It's the reunion. <laughs> 
by, by storm with his staggering physique, quick wit, and alluring charm. The Chicago native is a former athlete and scholar, as well as a visual artist and published author. He attended Alcorn State University, where he made his mark on the basketball team and graduated cum laude, thank you, laude, with a BA degree in communications. Soon thereafter, Timmon journeyed to California, where he honed his craft and pursued his dream of becoming an actor. Have you guys seen him? Yes. Seen him somewhere. Look familiar? <laughs> Look like that one guy from that one show, right? <laughs> no, 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 not that one, the other one. The other show, that one. Timmon landed guest star and co-star roles on television shows such as Girlfriends, Eve, clap if you recognize these names, <laughs> The Young and the Restless, CSI Miami, CSI New York, Vanished, Las Vegas, Heroes, Samantha Who, Melrose Place, The Ghost Whisperer, and Castle. Timmon, er, right? Sometimes you have to read your own resume and see how far you've actually come. You've done well. You've done well, brother. We're proud. <laughs> Timon earned rave reviews as the bad guy in his stage debut in the national tour of Tyler Perry's hit play. Okay, we weren't there yet. Hit play and again on The Marriage Counselor, where he garnered a legion of fans as the controversial Quinn Davis. In VH1's first ever scripted series, Single Ladies, he now plays the contentious Davis West on OWN TV's hit series, Queen Sugar. In 2015, Timon published his self-development book entitled, Who the Hell Do You Think I Am? Which, as he states, has done quite well, resulting in a new class of fans. Please welcome. Who the hell do I think I am? Or do you... That was personal. It was personal. I, you know, I had been carrying that one for a while, so a lot of people have been trying me, you know? Who the hell do I think I am? That's right. Very good. Thank you for the correction. There's nothing wrong with correction as long as it's done in love, okay? I receive it. Love you, cousin. <laughs> Thanks, cuz. Vincent Fuller is our next panelist. Baltimore native Fuller is a corporate associate at the law firm Freed Frank Harris Shriver and Jacobson in New York City. Prior to his legal career, Vincent played in the NFL for seven seasons as a defensive back for the Tennessee Titans and Detroit Lions. After his final season in 2012, Vincent decided to pursue a law degree. His decision was strongly influenced by the labor disputes between the NFL players and team owners that culminated in 2011 in the 2011 lockout regarding the NFL collective bargaining agreement. Vincent graduated from Fordham University School of Law in May 2017. During law school, he served as a legal intern at CBS Sports Network in Louis Vuitton. Cousin, do we still get the discount? <laughs> we don't? Okay. Prior to law school, he served as a fellow for Congressman Danny K. Davis of Illinois. Vincent is the oldest of four brothers who attended Virginia Tech and have either formerly played or currently play in the NFL. Please welcome Vincent Fuller. Anybody else hot? Might be an early flash. It's about 30 years early, but you know, they come and they go. Our next panelist is Leonard Hamilton. Coach Ham is currently in his 18th season as head coach of the men's basketball team at Florida State University. And he's in his 32nd season as a collegiate head coach. Can we give him some props for that? Well done. Hamilton's coaching career began at Austin P. State. That's all right. I ain't never heard of it. Just like y'all ain't never heard of Seaburn, okay? <laughs> Austin P. State University, where he served as a graduate assistant from 1971 to 1973, and then as a full-time assistant from 73 to 75. I said that right? Okay. Hamilton became the head coach of Florida State in 2002. Since then, he has become the most successful coach in Florida State history. Him. He represents us. He represents us at Florida State. 
Congratulations on that. And the Seminoles, he's also the Seminoles' all-time winningest coach and the seventh winningest coach in the eight, in ACC history. Again, congratulations. Hamilton has earned three national. We're going to have to hold applause for him because he got receipts. Okay, Hamilton has earned three National Coach of the Year awards, two Atlantic Coach, Coast Conference Coach of the Year awards. You're doing a lot, brother. Just slow down. Two Big East Coach of the Year awards. Okay. And he has led teams to nine, in, nine NCAA tournament appearances and 20 postseason appearances. In 2012, as head coach, he took the team to the ACC championship. He is the only person to earn Coach of the Year honors multiple times in both the ACC and the Big East. He was named the Clarence Big House Gaines National Coach of the Year in 2018 by the National Sports Media Association. Please welcome Coach Ham. Our next panelist, Ms. Jackie McWilliams, as the third full-time commissioner of the Central Intercollegiate Athletic Association, Jackie McWilliams is the first African-American female to ever hold the position. That's the cue applause. She leads all strategic planning for the conference, working closely with the 13 member institutions and the board of directors and staff to support the advancement of student athletes and managing 14 CIAA championships. Ms. McWilliams spent nine years at the NCAA where she managed championships. She also served as director of the Division I Women's Basketball Tournament from 2006 to 2009 and the Division I Men's Basketball Tournament from 2007 to 2012. She's a former student athlete from Hampton University where she was a member of the 1988 NCAA Division II Women's Basketball Championship team and the 1987 and 1999 CIAA Volleyball Championship teams. She currently serves on the Board of Directors for Women Leaders in College Sports, the NCAA Board Ad Hoc Committee for Cultural uh, cultural Diversity and the NCAA Board of Governors Federal and State Legislation Working Group. She recently completed her term as chair of the NCAA Division II Management Council and her appointment to the NCAA Board of Governors. Please welcome Ms. McWilliams. Congratulations. Our next panelist, Dr. Edward Scott. Hope y'all don't mind, I'm reading everyone's receipts, okay, because we need to know why they're up here. Dr. Edward Scott is in his third year as a director of athletics at Morgan State University. During his more than 15 years as an athletics administrator, Scott has served as a senior associate director of athletics at George Washington and Birmingham. Birmingham? Binghamton. Binghamton. There you oh, okay, go. see, because I'm from Florida, so, there you, go. You, got you know, all I saw was Birmingham. Okay. Universities while also spending time at the University of Louisville and his alma mater, the University of Albany. At Morgan, Scott oversees the department's 14 Division I programs with nearly 300 student athletes who compete for Mid-Eastern Athletic Conference, MEAC, and NCAA championships. Scott is a former standout baseball student athlete and captain for the University of Alb Albany. Following his collegiate career, Scott played independent professional baseball and gained experience coaching in two summer leagues with the Spartanburg Stingers of the Coastal Plains League and the Saratoga Phillies of the New York Collegiate Baseball League. Please welcome Dr. Scott. Dr. Robert Turner, Dr. Robert W. Turner II, is an assistant professor of clinical research and leadership at the George Washington University School of Medicine and Health Sciences, with a secondary appointment in the Department of Neurology. He currently holds an NIA funded, it's a grant, right? We're gonna call it a grant to better understand the neurocognitive and psychosocial risk and resilience factors presented to individuals who have experienced traumatic brain injuries. Turner is also the author of Not For Long, The Life and Career of the NFL Athlete. 
and a contributor on the LeBron James HBO documentary, Student Athlete. His experience as a former professional NFL player with the San Francisco 49ers and as a researcher provides an insightful perspective on the various factors that contribute to black male health disparities. Please welcome Dr. Turner. And our final panelist, Stan Wilcox. Stan Wilcox is the, NCAA, is the NCAA's second executive vice president of regulatory affairs. He is tasked with addressing all matters related to regulatory strategies consistent with the needs of the membership as well as oversight of academic and membership affairs. The Eligibility Center and Enforcement, he runs the show. Prior to joining the NCAA team, Wilcox served as a director of athletics for Florida State University before being promoted to vice president. During his successful five-year tenure, the Seminoles won the school's third football national championship in 2013, the university's first ever women's national soccer champion championship in 2014, and the school's first ever NCAA title in softball in 2008. Wow. He helped to create the Minority Opportunity Athletics Association and subsequently served as a member of its board. From 2003 to 2005, he was president of the Black Coaches Association. Wilcox graduated from Notre Dame in 1981, where he played a leading role in getting the men's basketball program to a four-year 92-26 record and four NCAA tournament appearances, including the 1978 Final Four. Please welcome Mr. Wilcox. And now our feature presentation, the Honorable Congressman Al Lawson. It's a real privilege uh, to be here and I wanna thank the panelists uh, that are here. Uh, this has always been very significant uh, discussion uh, here uh, all across America, really. And I think we have brought together, and I see Ms. Durant here who was with us last year, uh, to really uh, talk about the status of uh, black student athletes at the uh, in a university level. I might seem a little out of breath because I've been running from one activity uh, to the next, but I wanted to make sure I didn't want to miss my coach, uh, Coach Leonard Hamilton. Not that he coached me. Uh, he probably could have because he's a lot older than I am, but uh, <laughs> uh, not really. But we really want you all to engage our panel uh, for the information that is so prevalent. I see a couple of my staff people here, even from uh, Jacksonville, uh, Sherry and Tony Hill, happy y'all could be here. And I see uh, Senator Paris Thurston, one of my favorite senators out of Florida, Eric Riley, you know, and my staff is here. And, and then uh, the last poll mark that I know, you know, I wonder for Capitol Hill, I see Tommy Battles is here, yeah. Uh, so it is a real privilege uh, to have you all here, and I'm not going to prolong it, I'm going to try to wipe some of the sweat off my face, uh, to uh, where we can uh, moderate it. We are so fortunate uh, to have this young lady here uh, who has uh, been really, really great. Uh, I've been involved in college athletes, with college athletes for a very long time. Once as a coach uh, at Florida State University, and then as a supporter uh, in working with coaches uh, all across this country about uh, making sure that once uh, their careers are over uh, and they're long, no longer at the university, that they have the opportunity uh, to become productive citizens, you know, uh, in our society. Uh, when I was coming along in college, uh, that was really not the case. I remember I was telling Coach Hamilton when I got cut at Indiana uh, and in San Diego, uh, many of the guys that did not have a college degree, did not know what they were going to do. And I was fortunate at the time that I had a college degree and uh, after I got hurt and I knew uh, that I had a shot. I had a shot to be productive as some of the people that I was in college with. And, 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 and really, uh, uh, the life expectancy in football and basketball and some of the other sports is not as long as you really think, you know, uh, 
Uh, you see a lot of these players. I see we got ex NFL players here who are uh, played football uh, and basketball, and you see them on television, and you say, "Well, they got the big contract, and so forth." But I had a lot of guys I had opportunity to be with uh, in five or six years or seven years after it's all over. Many of them had a significant financial problems. Uh, I still work with athletes uh, 30 years later. They try to get them to come back and finish up their degree. And the reason why I was so excited about getting Coach Hamilton, because, boy, the remarkable results that he's had uh, with uh, athletes and their graduation rate and so forth to become productive. It'll be good not only to know it here, but throughout America what is possible. So I am not going to prolong. I'm going to turn it back over to the moderator. I'm so fortunate to have her here, and I'll be right down in a seat here trying to cool off and be available for any question y'all might ask. Thank you so much. Okay, you guys ready to get started? Okay, I'll wait till you're ready. It's fine. All right, I want to hear from the panelists about when you fell in love with the game. At some point in each of our careers, we fell in love with a game, the game, the adrenaline, the height of just being on the field or on that court. What was that moment like for you, and how did sports influence you in your career? We'll start with Mama Durant. Uh, okay. uh, can you all hear me okay? I think no? I have to turn it a little bit. Hello? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, when I fell in love with the, the, the game of basketball when, while watching my sons. Um, I played in junior high, but I was too girly. I wasn't really that interested in basketball. But, but while watching my sons play, um, I saw how, exci how excited they were uh, to play the game. And so that's when I fell in love um, with the game. And how did sports, how did that game, how did the game influence you in your career? Um, in the career that I have, I currently have now as a motivational speaker, and, and I go out and I speak to parents from the communities that I've come from, um, especially student athlete parents, and, and sharing some of the highs and lows that I experienced um, with my children. Um, and so I, I currently now uh, try to teach them that the importance of how to look at preparing your student for college, um, preparing him academically, and also preparing his body for the rigors of a uh, collegiate athlete. Um, and that's how I spend my mm -hmm. time currently. Thank you. Hi. Um, I uh, fell in love with the game when I realized that I did have athletic ability. Um, my first dunk was in high school. I, w I, didn't, I didn't play. Uh, sports until college. I was a late bloomer. I was disallowed. But, you know, being having that athletic prowess is when I fell in love with it and I was able to do the things that I didn't know I could do. And then um, with my coach, Coach Sam Weaver, when I was playing at Alcorn State University, um, he helped to instill in me a work ethic and athletics that I instill into everything else that I do. He would always tell me, you know, are you tired? Are you tired? I'm like, yes, coach. He said, good. That means you still got something left. You got something left in you. So I, I, I take that and I carry it over to everything I do in my life. You know, we all have trials and tribulations and hardships. But I always remember Coach saying, you, you, you got a little bit left. As long as you got some, some air in your lungs and, you, and your am ambulatory, meaning you can move, you got some left. And then he tell me that, to get your butt up and get back on the line. So that's my brief story. Thank you. I really didn't have a choice. Uh, <laughs> growing up, to be very honest with you, my, when my father told me that the only way I was going to get my education, I had to get a scholarship, an athletic scholarship. And the only, obviously he said two things, you can get an academic scholarship or an athletic scholarship. Well, athletics gave me a little bit more opportunity than the academic end. Um, but my, father, my mother went to the seventh grade, my father went to the ninth grade. There was eight of us living in a four-room house. The only way, my way was out, it was trying to get a scholarship. So basketball was uh, the most, advan most advantageous opportunity for me. But the interesting thing is I want to thank the Con uh, Congress of Black Caucus for having this forum. You, you have no, absolutely no idea how much this means. And I'm going to encourage you to get involved and, 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 and help uh, 
oversee a lot of things that, that's going on in, in athletics, especially with our black athletes. But in order for, when I got my education done, when I got my degree, I adopted my brother Willie. But when I adopted Willie, he graduated and both of his kids graduated. Barry went to college. My other brother, I adopted him. My brother John went to college because I went to college. Both of his kids graduated. You change the whole culture of a family right. yes. by getting your education. So this is serious what we're doing here. And I, I don't take it lightly. I want to make sure I congratulate the Congress for being a part of it. It's a lot of work needs to be done, and thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity. I, I do think this is a great panel. Um, I fell in love with the sport, with sports, because they said I couldn't play, the boys. Um, and you can't tell me I can't play. And so I took advantage of my own athletic ability to use sport as an avenue um, in my own community. Um, I don't care if it was football, bowling, or basketball. I was going to be good. And I used college athletics as an avenue, one, to get out of my house, because my parents gave me two choices. Well, the first choice is you can't stay. Um, <laughs> and the second choice is you can't stay. You need to do something. So it was either the military or college athletics. Um, and I chose to go to Hampton University from Colorado Springs. And I chose to be a walk-on. I had scholarship opportunities, but I wanted to go to a black college. I wanted that experience culturally to thrive and to live, whatever that was going to be, and to see people who look like me that could help me thrive. And my parents didn't understand that. My dad thought I should go to Boston College or CU or somewhere near home. And that wasn't an option. So they let me go. And it's because I got a scholarship. I worked hard to get my scholarship at Hampton University. And my parents helped me pay my first year. And I've never seen a bill since then. I earned my right to have a scholarship and learn how to navigate through a space through college athletics. Um, I know there's a lot of conversations about the why and what we do, but there's no way my parents could have paid for me to get a four-year degree. Um, I wouldn't have had access to NCA postgraduate scholarships to not pay for graduate school. And I wouldn't be the commissioner of this conference if it wasn't the absolute opportunity to be in college athletics. Awesome. Thank you. Ooh. <laughs> Call that a flag. <laughs> Uh, my father had a very similar conversation with me that Leonard's dad, Coach Hamilton's dad had with him. He said, basically, uh, you're going to college and I'm not paying for it. So we're going to find something that you can do to, uh, to go there, to get a scholarship. And I, uh, I basically played every sport that I could find, baseball, swam, basketball, football. Uh, I fell in love with football. In the ninth grade, between my ninth and tenth grade summer, I went to, they'll never have these now, but it was an all-contact football camp where you go off and it's a regional camp, so you go out with Pennsylvania, Virginia, New Jersey, New York. And I had always been pretty good locally, never like the best player on my team or like the best player in the league, but I'd always been decent. And I went to this camp and just dominated. And I won like most valuable player in, in any award that you can, can win. And I, I thought to myself, I might be pretty good. This might be what can give me a scholarship to college. And I just worked on it from that point on. Um, to answer the second question, how it affects what I do now, uh, quite simply put, as, you, as uh, you read in the bio, the collective bargaining agreement and the lockout in the NFL in 2011, there was negotiation between lawyers from the NFL Players Association and lawyers from the NFL determining whether or not we were gonna have a season, whether we were gonna get paid, whether I was gonna get paid, whether my brothers were gonna be able to go to high school because I was helping to pay their tuition. And I didn't, I didn't have the advocacy, advocacy skills and negotiation skills to know how that conversation was going and understand that at that point in time. And I basically said to myself, if there's ever a situation like that again in my life, I'm gonna garner those skills and be able to have that conversation. So that was great. Thank you. Before I share my story, I see some, some faces in the, in the crowd. Let me ask you, how many people here, just by a show of hands, are students right now, either in high school or college? Um, I just want to acknowledge you all because whatever we say here today is most important for them. It's going to impact their lives the most, and you will have great opportunities to make effective change. So I just want to thank you all for being here because it's that important. Give them a hand. 
And um, I'm from Newark, New Jersey, Brick City. Um, and I fell in love with, with football in particular, all sports, but football, I remember being just a kid. Or I'm, I don't know, I couldn't have been any more than seven or eight years old. And um, it was for Thanksgiving, and it was a football game. And I remember it was the New York Jets that were playing at the time. And I didn't know what the game was, but all I saw was that all the men in the room were screaming and hollering, and they were just so excited. And I just remember looking up and saying, whatever they're doing, that's what I want to do. And that drove me for the rest of my career. And so I was very fortunate enough to have the athletic ability to uh, make it you know, to college and to the pros and probably uh, have more determination and desire than athletic ability to get me there, which is why my career was so short. But uh, sports has changed my life in so many ways. I certainly would not have been able to go to college. I wouldn't have gone on to get a master's degree. I wouldn't have gone on to get a PhD. And without sports, I would never have been able to receive over a million dollars in grant money to be able to study um, issues related to sports and physical activity and how they affect uh, black male health. So I'm very appreciative of, of the game and sports and all the people that I've met along the way to help me realize dreams that I didn't even know I had. Well, I'd have to say my uh, story is somewhat similar to the other panelists up here. Um, uh, grew up uh, kind of middle class, parents uh, working two, three jobs. Um, knew that they wouldn't be able to afford to send me to college. Uh, but I was fortunate to have uh, an older brother, an older sister that I would love to always emulate and kind of try to do the things that they did. Um, older brother who loved basketball. I was a baseball player, but he loved basketball. And and then you get an opportunity to kind of play with the older guys, and, and all of a sudden you get better because of the fact that you're you're basically learning from your older sibling. And uh, that uh, put me in a position where uh, by high school, I didn't really know it, but I was pretty good. And uh, next thing you know, I'm being recruited by all the top institutions in the country. Uh, although um, Kentucky never recruited me, and I will always kind of wonder why Coach Ham didn't come to my house to recruit me. <laughs> this is an awkward family reunion already. <laughs> yes, it is. But, um, but, but then I make a decision and go to Notre Dame. I, go to, I decide to go to an institution where I knew the graduation rates were high. I knew uh, uh, Adrian Dantley, who was uh, out of the D.C. area here, was one of the top players at Notre, at Notre Dame, that they were on national television uh, at least eight, nine times a, a year. They, they had the biggest, the largest uh, uh, following as far as a basketball game every year against UCLA. That was kind of like the North Carolina Duke game nowadays. That was the Notre Dame-UCLA game back then. And my freshman year, I got an opportunity to play in a Final Four. And uh, then again, there was another guy in, that was on the, the assistant coach at Kentucky <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was also in that Final Four. It, it was supposed to be Notre Dame against Kentucky in the final, but we didn't, we didn't make it. Duke kind of knocked us off. But, but Leonard was on that Kentucky team that ended up winning the Final Four. But I was a part of uh, a, a freshman class. I was talking to Robert just a little earlier, a, a, a freshman class. We like to think of ourselves as the original Fab Five. But it was uh, Orlando Woodridge out of Louisiana, Tracy Jackson out of the D.C. area here, um, Gilbert Salinas, uh, tallest Mexican in the world out of San Antonio, Texas, <laughs> as well as Kelly and Kelly Trapuca out of uh, New, York, New Jersey. And uh, we always thought we were going to make it back to the Final Four. Uh, didn't realize how difficult it was to really get there, you know, but as freshmen, you're naive and you just think and you, and you know you have a great class and you think you're going to get back there again. You end up uh, in the next year, sophomores losing the Magic Johnson and crew in the, in the uh, Elite Eight and they go on to win it all. And, uh, and then by, by our senior year, we end up uh, losing to Brigham Young in one of the, um, the, the biggest uh, last second shots ever. We, five seconds left and Danny Ainge goes the full length of the court and makes a layup and we're done. Uh, I was actually happy because I, I thought no more digger. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it, it, uh, basketball and being an athlete, being a student athlete, uh, really um, you know, propelled my career, my life 
um, because, you know, I start seeing, uh, you know, uh, although back then it was very, very few, I start seeing, you know, African Americans in, uh, in, in good positions. I saw Leonard Hamilton in a great institution at Kentucky as assistant coach. I saw um, John Thompson, who was the head coach at Georgetown at the time. And, uh, you know, I start thinking about uh, what I would want to do with my life uh, beyond um, basketball and beyond uh, playing at Notre Dame. And, and just knowing that there were those out there that were in the field, you know, gave me the encouragement to uh, eventually get my law degree and uh, utilize my background as a former student athlete, as a, uh, a coach one year at CW Post College you know, on Long Island, my background as a coach. And then my law degree to um, get involved with the NCAA uh, at, a, at a very early stage and get to understand how that organization worked and uh, get involved in trying to help make positive change, not only for uh, student athletes, but also for coaches along the way. And, uh, you know, 30 years uh, has been great. Um, and uh, as I tell Edward, uh, you know, I'm, I, I got about four more years and I'm going to drop the mic and I'm going to be done. <laughs> but, uh, but it's been a, been a great career and it, uh, a- athletics uh, really propelled me to be where I am today. Uh, truth be told, Stan did say that. He said, hey, man, I got about four years left and I'm out of here. So... <laughs> Um, my situation very similar to everybody else, except uh, it was my mother who got me into sports. Uh, I grew up with a single mother. Uh, she had me when she was going to community college. I'm a first generation college student, so uh, she instilled in me uh, very early that sports was a vehicle to get an education. So much so that when I made a little league all star team and I got some C's on my my uh, report card, uh, my mom came to the field and pulled me off the field. Uh, So I knew early on that I had to match the two up together. I was blessed to have um, some athletic ability, be able to run well. uh, And I really wanted to play baseball because we got to compete about four or five times a week. Uh, I like to compete. It's difficult for me to sit around and sit still, play a football game, lose on Saturday, and have to wait all week again to to get mine back. Um, So I chose baseball. I I was really blessed. Uh, that I went to the university at Albany. And when I went to university at Albany, we had a gentleman named Dr. Lee McElroy, uh, who was our athletic director. He, at the time, he was one of only 12 in the country in Division I. Uh, and as I said, I grew up without a father. And so somehow we took to each other. Uh, and he really shaped my career, let alone my life as a student athlete, from the way he dressed uh, to the values that he had in education. And so um, when I was at Albany, I had a very good run as a baseball player, um, academic All-American, and played some professional baseball. But the biggest thing that that Lee taught me was to always give back, right? You want to give back to the student athlete. And so when you ask what the sport has done for us or what it meant to us, it's my entire lifestyle. I mean, my provost is here from Morgan today, one of my assistant ADs, and I'd be really remiss. Arjun, put your hand up for me. Arjun is one of our former student athletes at Morgan State who helped us win a tennis championship last year. And he's now studying his graduate work here at, uh, in DC at, at GW, at George Washington. So for me, that's, that's what baseball has done. It's given me an opportunity to set my family up for generations and earn a doctorate, but then also to give back to others who can put their families in position to do whatever they'd like to do. So we've, we've all been very blessed as you can hear. I want to thank each one of you for being in position to make a difference in this conversation. So thank you for everything that you've already done, and let's get into the conversation. Well, I first fell in love with sports when the kickball came to me. It was coming fast, too. I was like, oh, boy. I'm going to have to send it past third. They ain't going to see it coming. They ain't going to see it coming. And after that, I was picked first every time. It was amazing. But I did go on to to play sports. I was a cheerleader. That is a real sport. I cheered. Come on, cheerleaders. Anybody got a W-I-N in their spirit? Okay. A cheerleader, volleyball, track, soccer, swimming. I actually did not know how to swim when I joined the team. I only went to to the tryouts for extra credit because my honors math teacher. Okay, anyway, they put me on the team. 
and and I learned how to swim and I swam for two years after that I was also a state weightlifter um, I think I still hold a work record and they put my name on in the gym in my small town of Sebring so thank you guys for honoring that but I actually had a very love hate relationship with sports because I grew up with a famous uncle growing up in Sebring Sebring is about 90 90 minutes south of Orlando, Florida. My uncle was the first high school player to go straight from high school to the NBA, uh, Mr. Daryl Dawkins, better known as Chocolate Thunder. Anybody know about the Thunder? <laughs> so we don't really uh, play by the rules, but I really hate it when people would ask me about my uncle because for most of my life, I only knew him as a cardboard cutout, no lie. He was a cardboard in the dining room behind the couch like this at, at every family reunion. So uh, that is my relationship with sports, but sports also taught me discipline, and I had no idea how much it was helping me as far as my mental health. It wasn't until after I completed my sports journey in high school and went to college that I realized I needed a little bit more. So I'll pose this question to you, Mama Durant. Have you noticed any, uh, throughout your children's careers, how sports played a role in their mental health? Yes, uh, sports was pivotal in their, their mental health and their mental stability today. I can see, um, especially with my uh, younger son, Kevin, um, he's had, it's been tough. It hasn't been easy. He makes it look easy, but it hasn't been easy for him. But the four, he's fortified and his resilience is because of the lessons that, he, that I instilled to him at home and that was uh, supported um, in the gym. Uh, through his coaches and high school and college and even in an NBA. So he has a resilience that, that was uh, taught through the, uh, the avenue of sports. Yes. Okay, to the, to the coaches, who is responsible for the mental health of the athlete? Coach Ann, we'll start with you. We're, we're charged with the responsibility of taking a youngster from a teenager to a young adult. And you're the surrogate family when they're away from home. You have to take that position seriously. I spend more time coaching their minds and their spirits and actions than I do their bodies. I'm proud of the fact that in the last 27 years, I've only had five kids not graduate that have been with me for five years. Now, I say that, I say that not to brag, but because all my kids have not been cum laude. They've been guys like me, old Lordy, instead of Kumla. <laughs> now, <clears throat> but it's so important that you understand you got youngsters at the most important, most vulnerable time in their lives when they're forming their ideas of how they're going, what kind of husbands, what kind of fathers, what kind of neighbors, what kind of citizens they're going to be. And, and if, if you don't pour into them and take the job seriously, uh, that, that bad things happen. I, I, I always cringe when I read those things in the paper that sometimes we make poor decisions. But so, so I'm proud of the fact that that's probably the, the, the most important thing we do. Obviously we have to win to keep our jobs. But I, mean, I got a lot of uh, trophies and watches and rings, but the most important thing is when they call me on Father's Day, when they, when they send me a Christmas card, wow. when they want me to be, meet their fiance, uh, when they want me to, 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 to be the godfather of their kids. And that's when you know that you're impacting youngsters' lives and, and when you do that the right way, you have positive results. Um, I, I have the opportunity to coach, too, and I, I totally agree with what Coach has said. I think what's interesting in being an administrator, and particularly I'll talk about the CIAA and what we do around mental health um, to ensure that our membership is educated um, and our student-athletes have access to the opportunities to get the help they need on their campuses, but also through our conference leadership programs. I mean, studies show, and, and Dr. Turner could probably you know, tell you more about what he deals with on the mental health side, but what we're seeing is mental health is happening before these kids are even getting to the institutions. There are a lot of things that are happening prior to them getting, like my daughter's 13 and I had to share with her, there's no pressure for you to be anything but your best. 
right? We're putting a lot of pressure on our kids, all of us. You got to get a scholarship or get out. Mm -hmm. You got to do something. That's a lot of pressure to put on kids um, for success and what that looks like academically, to have good grades, to make sure that scouts are coming to see you and preparing yourself every single day, to be a student athlete, to be a student, and then to help some of us having to help our families at home, whatever that looks like. So there's all these little pieces that come into an 18-year-old trying to manage being an 18-year-old that we're asked to do or asked to do. And so as men administrators, coaches, from recruiting all the way to when they get to our campuses, we do have a responsibility, uh, not just in college at, at, at the athletic, but the institution, to make sure that there's resources for our students to get the help that they need, and for us not to make it a stigma. We call it mental wellness opposed to mental illness, because the stigma of mental illness in our community means there's something you're crazy. Mm -hmm. And that's not necessarily true. Our job is to help these student athletes be their best and to identify what the issues are and get them the help and to educate. I will also say that administrators, including myself, we ha I have mental health issues too, or illness, wellness, right? And so you're asking me to help a student athlete when I'm not even mentally prepared to help Talk myself. And so we're talking about that in our conference with our presidents about how do we make sure that our coaches are well so that they can make sure that their student athletes are well. How do I make sure that that athletic director that I know is not doing good, that we are having conversations and even asking that AD, are you okay? Because if we're family, which we are in the CIAA, yes. we're taking care of everybody, right? So it's way beyond the game for us in our conference. It's more about making sure that the family's taken care of because your success is the success of our brand in the conference. And so we all have a responsibility to make sure before the kids even get there as parents, right, as uncles and aunts, that we're identifying what those issues are and making sure that we're even having conversations with coaches when your kid, before they get there, that there's something going on. That is so important. I didn't realize how much it helped me because I was struggling with anxiety and depression from the age of eight. My earliest memory of trying to take my own life was eight years old. Mine was 10. 10 years old. So this is, this is a deeply rooted issue, and I applaud you and the CIAA you. for your initiatives. You had a, a follow-up, Mama Durant. Y yes, I did. Um, when my sons uh, I was become, were student athletes and, and headed to college, mental wellness was not uh, a concern of mine. It was just, as your parents, you need to get a scholarship. You're going to college, and how you're going to do it is through sports. Mm -hmm. And so it was imperative. I knew that I, my sons needed to be around men that... I trusted with my son's uh, mat uh, maturity process, and so it was vital. And so any parent in here, when, when your students go off to college, it's imperative that you uh, develop a relationship with the adults that's going to be an influence yes. in your children's lives. Absolutely. That's so good. Dr. Scott, you're overseeing 300 student athletes at, at Morgan State. How, how do you manage the mental, not everyone's mental health, but how do you provide resources for them? First thing I do is pray. Um, no, I'm serious. It's an awesome responsibility, right? And, and everyone's needs are different. Um, and what we haven't talked about yet, the one thing that I think adds to the mental health issues that we see with our young people, mostly 18 to 22 year olds, is social media, right? There's an added pressure that, that none of us up here, frankly, on this panel had to deal with, right? And Mama Duran spoke to it. I mean, Kevin makes a decision to leave Golden State and go to New Jersey and all over social media, he's got to deal with it. Now, he's more equipped than our student athletes because he has experience and more resources. But to answer your question directly, I think it's a shared responsibility. It really is. Jackie hit on it from the conference office. Stan and, and the NCAA um, are working with the member institutions to help provide resources. Uh, we're about to apply. Terrence is about to apply for an AASP grant um, for a mental health professional to come on campus. Uh, and our population at Morgan has a whole set of other issues, right? Mostly first generation college students, mostly low income. And so when you start adding that on, right, as a cumulative or a compounding effect to uh, going to college or moving away from home for the first time, I mean, there's just so many variables that we have to look at. So what we really try to do is we try to listen and we try to be there. Sometimes you can't fix everything, but being an ear or being a resource for a student athlete is often more than many of my student athletes have ever had. Yeah. And so I think when we start with there, meeting the student athlete individually where they're at, 
and then trying to build the support around them that will put them in a position to be successful to achieve what they're trying to achieve and not necessarily what I want them to achieve. I think at the end of the day, we found pretty good success at Morgan over the last three years doing that. Now, Dr. Turner, I had, a, I had the opportunity to watch the student athlete documentary on HBO with a student athlete, my cousin. She's a 17-year-old senior track star, softball star in Decatur, Georgia. And I said, look, you need to watch this because it's going to put you on game, okay? They'd, I didn't have these resources when I was a student athlete, so this is what you need to know. You're trying to get scholarships. Take notes. In that documentary, we saw so many, we heard so many heartbreaking stories about mental health and homelessness and adding the pressure of celebrity to the student athlete lifestyle, what kind of, of effects are, can we expect from this? <laughs> A lot. Um, I could take the rest of this time to answer that whole question. Okay. Um, so I will talk about from this perspective of Shamar, Shamar Graves, who was in the movie. Um, and if y'all haven't seen it, I, I think it's really important. It's uh, on HBO. How many people have seen the student athlete documentary? Yeah, and, and the rest, please do, because I think all the issues that we're talking about mm -hmm. are so important. So if we just, you know, kind of use him as a case to kind of understand, um, his background was such that Shamar lost his father at a very young age, and his dad had played in the NFL. And so his mom all of a sudden found herself as a single mom raising three people, and um, they found themselves after she lost her job. They were homeless, and he lived in a car for a number of years. Um, but in Shamar's mind, he felt that it was really important for his job to lift the family out of poverty and to fulfill the dream that uh, he had in his own mind of how his dad played, and he wanted to do the same same thing. And he put a lot of pressure on himself. There was no structure at the school that he went to, Rutgers, and it was at a time when Rutgers was really their most successful time that they had um, in, in college football history when Cosciano was there. So they were really trying to raise the profile. He saw himself in, as only, only seeing success on one level, and that is if I make it to the NFL. And when those things didn't happen, it really crushed his, his spirit, his identity, and it was very difficult for him to see anything other than I have to succeed on that level. And that really sent him down in depression and spiraled in those. And he's still really uh, struggling with those things. We're working with him today to try to get him uh, in a better place. But I think in part, his pressure came internally, but it also came from the expectations that society has on a person like him, where he saw his, like he said in the movie, I'm, look, I'm playing in a game and I see people wearing my jersey. People are making money from my jersey. And he goes, and then I go home and I see myself in Madden, and that's me. And he goes, so I'm already thinking as a freshman, I'm in the NFL, right? So we have to think about structurally, how do we support folks like that? Because people come with so many different issues that they come to the sport with already, and then we tell them, just win, baby, right? <laughs> And, and, and it makes them so much more difficult for them at a young age to try to figure all of this stuff out. And, and in part, that's what the movie is kind of about. And we see people struggling with some of those issues. And it, to me, it's mind boggling that a university that spends millions of dollars um, you know, trying to raise money and, 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 and through alumni and all of these other things. They, they got budgets of 75, 85 million dollars, but they can't figure out how to support the needs of these athletes, both as they transition from high school to college and then transition from college into real life beyond sports. There's no way to figure out how to help them and listen to them and give them the support they need. That's mind boggling to me. We're going to have to do another panel, Congressman, next year on the mental health of the black student athlete. Now, we're talking about social media, but if we expand it more to media, media really drives everything. It, it drives the conversation. It's the reason they want to get likes and follows. It's the reason they are a celebrity, because they have the likes and follows. And so they're always trying to reach something or even be on TV or be in the game or be in the documentary. Everybody wants to be featured. That's a lot of pressure. What advice would you give to me as a black journalist writing stories about us in sports? Well, let me start with that. 
<laughs> my son is taking a beating right now <laughs> and has been for the last few years. The one thing that I would suggest to journalists is to, to, to write the truth and not get into this the spindle of the narrative that's being posed on these athletes. Um, a lot of what's been said about my son is really just not true. He's made some decisions that people didn't like and now the narrative one person's narrative is the complete yeah. narrative on my son and a lot of I've seen this with a lot of athletes uh, collegiate and professional athletes and that's really unfair because they can never get out the spin cycle and who they really are um, is not shown forth like he just did an article with the Wall Street uh, Journal athlete uh, on the cover of the Wall Street Journal magazine that's a story in itself but um, the, the false narrative is continued to be spewed onto the people. So you will never get to know who these athletes really are. And so what I would suggest to you as a journalist is get to, to write outside of the current narrative or mm -hmm. find out what that is. Tell the whole story. Be fair and balanced. Seek the truth and report it. Believe it or not, that's what they teach us. Everybody doesn't <laughs> practice it, but that's actually what they tell us as, as journalists, period. Um, I want to move on to more media. There's a new commercial from the NCAA, um, an advertisement demonstrating the day in the life of a student athlete. The commercial shows a black male basketball player going to class, working out, socializing, playing a game, and then happily going to bed. Y'all seen it? <laughs> Everything looks great on GoPro, I'm telling you. If you just put the camera here, it just gives you a different perspective. The ad received criticism from current and former athletes. Some said it was a false depiction of the actual rigorous lifestyle of a student athlete. Mr. Fuller, <laughs> tell us about the day in the life of a student athlete. It is rigorous. Um, it, it, involves, it involves trying to manage the time that you have, the time that you have in a 24-hour day and, and get a good night's sleep, it's, it's extremely hard. You, you wake up most times before 6.30 to do something related to your athletic performance, whether it be weightlifting, whether it be watching film, uh, et cetera. Then you go, go to class. You have class, you know, six or seven hours out of the day, depending on how many classes you have. And then the afternoon all the way through the evening is again spent on trying to perform, trying to get better, whether it be in a team environment or individually, because you know you have the stresses of trying to perform and be as good as you can on the, the whatever field you're playing on, whether it be a basketball court or a football field. Um, and then you also have to study. You have to be prepared for uh, class the next day or the next you know the next exam that's coming up. So so it is rigorous. I. Uh, I can, you know, vividly remember waking up before 6.30 and, and not being able to go to sleep once taking care of everything that I had to do both athletically and academically uh, well past midnight, one o'clock. So you're only getting four or five hours of sleep. You have to try to fit in meals and nutritious meals at that, which is another thing in itself in, in college. So it is rigorous. Um, I've seen the commercial, I think in the 30 second bit, they, the NCAA tried to do as, as good of a job as possible, but it isn't necessarily a true depiction of an NCAA college athlete. The one thing I did like that the, the commercial said at the end is if you have the drive and determination to be a successful student athlete, we'll provide the opportunity. I think a lot of it goes back to the accountability of the player. And if you do have that drive and determination, you can sort of manage your time in a way to put your best foot forward in both avenues. And although the commercial didn't shine a light on bright, as bright as I think it probably could have, there is some truth to being accountable as a student athlete to try to do the best that you can. Thank you. Tim, and I'm gonna give you a chance to respond and then Mr. Wilcox, we'd like to hear from you. Sure. Uh, well, I, going to Alcorn State University was kind of a culture shock for me coming from Chicago and then going to the sticks of Mississippi. <laughs> if anybody knows about that area back in the mid 90s, but I, I can tell you this, my, my coach decided we we're gonna have practice at five in the morning. So I remember getting up at 4.30, going to practice, running for 15 minutes, practicing for an hour and a half to, uh, to an hour and 45 minutes, mandatory breakfast, then you had class, and then you had uh, mandatory lunch, and then after that you had practice, then some of us had classes after that, then you had study hall, um, and then you had whatever social life you had to, to, to have, and, and then like you said, you had to study, you had to do homework, and then you, by the time your, your, your day is done, where everyone else is just having class and then finishing up and then out hanging out in the yard, you are flat out exhausted. Mm -hmm. 
and you know, and then it, cre it creates this, this irritability. And where you, I, I don't know if you all have ever experienced it, where you see the athletes where they have this stare and this glare, where this, you know, hey, what's going on? My nickname was Tree in college. Hey, Tree, I'm like, hey. And I'm just zoned, I'm, I'm zoned out because I'm so, so drastically fatigued. So, you know, to see a commercial like that, it, it's good. It gets the, 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 the blanket, the surface stuff, but there's a whole lot more that comes with that, the, the pressure, the having to, um, have to manage your own expectations and try to live up to other people's expectations mm -hmm. and navigate through temptations of do I go over here or do I hang out and drink over here or do I go to study hall and and everything that comes with being a young person in a in a in a for me in a a very rural area not having a car where I have one class on one side of campus and I got 10 minutes to get to the other side and I just spent an hour and 45 minutes breakneck speed running with coach because he believed in running to have to run to class and be exhausted in there and and try to maintain the uh, the, 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 the 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 just the gumption to do what the other students who aren't athletes do so it's it's it, it can be very very grueling and I think that can take a toll like you going back so I don't want to you know be loquacious but that also contributes to the mental health aspect of it when you are literally burned out and you have to keep going because of the expectations that uh, you have to live up to as a student athlete. It, it gets hard. Georgia, before you go to Stan, though, go ahead. so when we played back in the 90s, the rules were different. Mm -hmm. There were really no restrictions, in my opinion. So my coach could practice me three times a day, maybe, right? And I'd be lucky to try to, can't get no nap, because either you're going to study or you're going to take a nap or you're not going to pass your class. Like, your day was full. So now you come to a new age where legislation has changed, where student athletes now, we have time management. Mm -hmm. You can only practice a certain amount of time a day. You can only practice a certain time a week. You've got to do, we want them to be in the community. We want them to be in leadership. So things have changed drastically since I know when I played, because my coach didn't care. You're going to class, but you're going to practice in the morning. You're going to come back later in the afternoon, and you might come back at night to do film. So it's a very different mentality with these kids now where the legislation has changed. Wow. The uh, only thing I'd add is, number one, you, you, you can't put um, the day in the life of a student athlete in a 31-minute uh, um, commercial. You just can't do it. Uh, particularly also when, you know, the, the, the NCA is made up of uh, athletic departments that are at different levels, Division One, Two, II, and Three, And even within Division One, you have what you call Autonomy Five conferences or schools that have the highest budgets. Uh, and and, and the, the, the day in the life of a student athlete at these different schools are totally different. Mm -hmm. But what Jackie's saying is true also that uh, legislation has changed uh, so that uh, the time demands of student athletes, you, you have to make sure that you're, they're getting the right time uh, or the amount of time so that they can devote to their studies, that they can get away from their sports. Now. Some may disagree with that. Uh, you know, you know, Lennon and I sometimes will have. When I was the AD there, we'd have debates about that because, and he, and, and some of those things are right, because sometimes you want to have more time with your kids, because a lot of that is mentoring and making sure that they're going to be doing the right things. I tell you, the day in the life of an athletics director, people used to ask me, what is the most, the, the one thing that you fear about or you're always concerned about on a daily basis? I said, I got 500 kids who are basically my kids. And when I go to bed at night, you know, I'm afraid that when I wake up in the next morning, I'm going to see this rap sheet or I'm going to see, you know, the, the, something in the paper about something that one of my kids done, has done. Um, but when you have a little more control over that, over their, their, their time, you can kind of take, take away some of the bad things that can potentially occur. And I'll tell you, I tell people, you know, five years at Florida State was kind of like 10 years anywhere else based upon the number of issues and the number of things that we went through during that time. Yeah, we had some, we had some great <laughs> championships and things of that nature, but yeah, Leonard, you know, right? <laughs> Not in basketball. I didn't say that. <laughs> and <laughs> he know he know Leonard. I didn't have to do anything. You know, he he kept he kept things under control there. But there are some of these other sports and some of these other kids. 
<laughs> yeah, I, w I would lay, a, lay in bed at night and I couldn't sleep because I knew that next day, particularly after a Sunday home game. So, <laughs> I mean, Saturday home game, that's all I'm going to say. Before you, I would like to talk about how you manage all those players over the years. My worst nightmare is to pick up paper and find that someone has done something inappropriate. But I spend an awful lot of time talking about these things with my youngsters. Uh, I don't ever leave a practice without saying I don't want no dumb stuff. Uh, I have sex education, drug education. I have media training. I check curfew. Um, uh, I, I'm not one of those mean Tarrant type persons, but I don't put up with any foolishness. If you don't go to class, you don't play. If you don't do what you're supposed to, you don't play. I don't have any problems. I, I never, now, you need to say one thing, Stan. You were there five years. You never had a problem with one of my players. That's so true. All right. I just want to make sure I got No problem. I'll right. <laughs> <laughs> we'll make sure I clear the air on that. Yeah. Now, but, now, but, but that's because I think you have to take your position as a, as a coach and as an administrator seriously. A lot of these kids come from a lot of different homes. And I look out on the audience. I see all these halos over all y'all heads. Mm -hmm. Well, I didn't have a halo on mine. I was a problem. And so I understand kids can get into issues. So if you don't work at it all the time, and, and, and sometimes you got kids just growing up and maturing. So it's really, really challenging. Sometimes good kids find themselves in difficult situations. But we really, really spend a lot of time because I feel like that's probably the most important thing about our jobs as administrators and as coaches. Uh, but I work hard at it, and I realize uh, that for me, uh, uh, I didn't mind getting up working hard. I didn't mind the sacrifice I had to make because that's the only way I had out. And, and, and you have youngsters on your team, that's their only way out. And, and, and so as a coach, you give them the right tools mentally and emotionally. And if you give, my experience has been when you give youngsters the information, they make pretty good decisions. And that's one reason why I guess one reason why I don't have a whole lot of issues because I try to address any and everyone. I try to operate in a preventive posture to make sure. Now, I've had some near issues, but if it boils down that they might have a little, you might want to use the word respect, and some people might say it might be fear. But however I have to get my point across, <laughs> I'm going to make sure that it's done because the bottom line is youngsters are teenagers growing into young adults. Mm -hmm. And I know y'all were perfect, but I wasn't, and my kids are not either. And, and so if you, as long as you go in, if you don't, anything bad will happen if you let it happen. That's just been my person. That's been my philosophy. And I take a lot of pride in the fact that our kids do things the right way. And the only thing... I the other thing I would add to that, uh, you've got to also realize, particularly in two sports, um, it helps when there are individuals that are uh, in charge that look like those student athletes who are participating in those sports. Um, and uh, we, uh, over the years, you know, we've fought and fought to, um, to get more and more African-American head coaches in the sports of basketball and football, um, back in the days when the BCA was in existence, as well as the, the Minority Opportunities uh, Fund, I mean, um, program, et cetera. But it, it does make a huge difference um, in a kid's life and, and how well they can do uh, at the collegiate level when there are people that look like them that they can emulate, that they can really feel that, yeah, you know, I can be, I can be that. And it's when you don't have that, uh, those role models, those individuals that look like those kids that are participating in those sports, that's when you end up having some more difficult times and more issues that kind of, uh, kind of arise. And, and, and I think that, uh, you know, over the years, uh, obviously we try and try to make that point and get that point across and uh you know we there are the years when you, things got better there were more and more head coaches in, in basketball but we we regress 
you know, they you get to a point where people think that oh well everything is good now, but it's not. Uh, we still we still need to fight that battle, uh, particularly in those sports of football and basketball. I, I just I, I want to jump in real quick because um, I'm a trained as a sociologist, and so really. I understand, I've been able to, for, for the book that I wrote, I was able to travel across the country and I inter interviewed 140 athletes to try to understand what their experiences were like uh, in their life prior to the NFL and what their life was after. And then being involved with the movie, I was able to uh, travel across this country and I have had the fortune of speaking to you know, literally hundreds of athletes. And what it really comes down to, what I'm hearing here, is that all programs aren't the same. Right. There are some places starting from the top down where the ath athletic department provides a culture for for young people to, th to thrive in. And then there are other programs where I have literally had people crying, telling me that they were mentally, emotionally and sometimes physically abused in their programs. And many of these these programs that when people talk to me, these are young ladies that are playing in sports. Right. So um, it's been heartbreaking to hear how some people had a love for sports. They get involved. They play for coaches in environments where they just feel absolutely broken and beaten down. But then you also have these other places where people, they were very much enriched and it helped where they turn around and they call their coaches and say, you helped turn me into a man, right? So I think it's really important to understand from the top all the way down, who's in charge of these programs and what is the culture that, they're, that they are um, really trying to establish and what is their overall goal? If they're really trying to invest in these young people, we see some very positive things. If it's about the money, we see some very negative things. Wow, you guys still out there? How do you feel about the conversation so far? How many people have their own questions? Ooh. We're going to get to your questions in just a few minutes. We have a few more, few more questions here. I want to transition to an article that came out a few weeks ago in The Atlantic by Jamel Hill. Now, Jamel Hill was a 2018 NABJ Journalist of the Year. She wrote an article suggesting that black student athletes take their talents to HBCUs. Her article highlighted the financial benefits for black schools, but many liberal news outlets accuse her of calling for segregation. Now, for those of y'all who remember segregation, what, how, how was, what was your response to the article, and do you believe that calling for segregation, that, that term is fair? Are you asking me? Because I think all students should go to HBCUs. <laughs> That's what I think. You know, I, I, I had a chance to talk to Jamil. She came to our tournament. We run one of the largest tournaments in the country. We're about the third largest. It's in Charlotte, North Carolina. We'll be in Baltimore in 2021. To, uh, is it 20, 2021? Yeah. 21. Um, so we're looking forward, and CIAA has the opportunity to really showcase its student athletes, but use the game mm -hmm. to impact communities. Like Mr. Rant said, all the work that she does, we get to do in college athletics. Um, I loved how she did her homework and talked to me or other HBCUs, to students, the reasons why they chose or didn't cho choose um, to go to an HBCUs. And as much as we like everyone to come to HBCUs, we know that's not gonna happen. I will tell you that I wish that every student and parent would start thinking that HBCUs could be in the top five of your list and not the last. Mm -hmm. That's a problem. Um, I also wish that um, we stop thinking that HBCUs can be comparable to uh, a Wake Forest or a UNC or a Duke. We're not. We have our own. We have our own institutions to educate our students. We we absolutely were built and thrived to educate Black people because that was the only avenue and access you had, right? And then that was the only avenue and access you had to sport back in the day, and so you came there to compete when. Integration happened, of course, and we saw that athletes were good where we were. The game changed, the money changed, the access changed. HBCU still kind of stayed the same, but our premise of who we are still stays the same. We're still trying to graduate students, which we are at a higher rate, and we're still trying to give student athletes an opportunity to play in an environment. It may not be the environment of Duke or Carolina or Notre Dame, but it is an environment where they can get an education, be culturally sound, and have an opportunity to be a commissioner if they choose to be. And so 
I always will believe that HBCUs have a place. And I'll always believe that we should stop thinking that they can't be in the top five and that parents shouldn't be talking, should not be telling their kids that they shouldn't go to a Hampton University because it's a black university. That's incorrect as a community and as a culture if we do that. Yeah, my family, because I, I grew up white, I don't know if you guys can tell, but uh, <laughs> Sebring, okay? Sebring, once again, 16% black. So my, my family really encouraged me to go to a black school didn't have to be FAMU or Cookman, but a black school to get the black experience. And sadly, I was really out of touch. I didn't know how not black I was mm -hmm. until I got there and I was required to take intro to African American <laughs> history. And I was like, oh, I, I did that already, right? I got like a birth certificate. <laughs> yeah, I got a C. I really struggled in that class, but thank God for FAMU. Uh, great points. I want to move on to a, a a student who Jamel highlighted in her article, last summer Kayvon Thibodeau, who was then ranked as the top high school football player in America, visited FAMU. Ultimately, he announced that he was going to one of the top football programs in the country at the University of Oregon. His reason? Nobody wants to eat McDonald's when you can have filet mignon. <laughs> Timon, you went to an HBCU? Yes, I did. Tell us about your experience. What really made the HB your HBCU stand out? Well, yeah, fish on Friday. <laughs> and, and fried chicken Wednesday. Okay, anybody yeah, yeah, yeah. have fried chicken Wednesday? Fried chicken Wednesday. Yeah. What's today? Thursday. Okay. I thought that was just us. <laughs> but no, I um, you know, I was I was um, relaying a story to uh, my friend Taru earlier, where we uh, my, our school we were, I guess, uh, allowed to play the University of Arkansas Razorbacks. And you know, coming, you know, this is my first college experience as an athlete. I, I you know, I didn't play any other sport at any other time in my life other than college. And, you know, I, I, we, we went to the university and we went into the, uh, I got into the, the guest locker room. And I was, I was blown away by, the, I, I was like, this is the guest locker room? It looked better than some NBA locker rooms that, you know, you see on camera with the interviews and things like that. They had people making us sandwiches and the Gatorade machines didn't even have the coin slot. You just pick whatever you want. And, um, and, and just looking at everything. And then we go back to our school and we were like, man, this, this kind of sucks. So I, I, I look at the, the, when you look at, if someone says, hey, you know, I can give you an opportunity to make $100,000 a year doing something that's okay. And I can give you an opportunity to make $50,000 a year to do something that you love. It's kind of a, 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 you know, a dilemma. But when you look at the, the differences in, in the money, which gives you access to better housing, better meals, better uh, facilities for training, uh, better facilities to play at, the, the, the actual draw, your, your, uh, uh, the propensity or the potential to be seen more by someone who can launch you to another level. So I understand that. But what we need to do is, in my opinion, is to, if in, in some way, because I know everyone up, up here, I feel like I'm, I'm in kindergarten with all these fantastic people, but I, I notice the, the financial differences where the funding goes, like our, our workout facility and our uh, gym floor and where we had to go and train outside was nothing. And I mean absolutely nothing. It got us running around in dirt fields where they have multiple tracks. like that draw when you have the, 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 the dream to go to an NBA or NFL or MLB or whatever your dreams are, whatever uh, college sports you play, I can understand why a young person who could possibly come from nothing can be a star in this new world and bring his whole family up, you know, and say, well, why would I go to an HBCU? I can go there and get my education. But this school right here is going to let me be this superstar athlete that's going to launch me into my greatness to where education really won't be a problem. They say, well, I'm already rich. What well, I need education for? So I can, I can understand why they would want to do that. But I think that that mindset needs to change because I, I, I lived you know, that to see the differences in, that's not even one of the biggest, but just the disparity in, in, in how much they have, how much more that they have at other schools and the HBCUs, it's a, it's a little depressing. It was for me uh, and disappointing, but, you know, it's just one of those things where, you know, there's, there's got to be a change, you know, and, and, I, and I, like you said, I think that, you know, the culture of an HBCU, I would much rather have had that experience with those sorts of, sorts of resources, you know, as opposed to going to someplace else and where there are people who don't really appreciate me for anything other than my athletic prowess. 
You know what I'm saying? Yeah, that's good. Dr. Scott, how do, how, what was your initial response to the article? You know, well, we work with Jamel Hill and Bill Roden and the Undefeated at Morgan. We have a phenomenal school of global journalism and communication. So um, I, I wasn't surprised, but I, I do want to say a couple of things because my path to becoming an AD at an HBCU is very, very different um, than most people would think. I've never went to an HBCU as a student. I've uh, never been affiliated with an HBCU. I had worked at four large, predominantly white institutions before coming to Morgan. Frankly, I didn't even know where Morgan's campus was until they gave me directions, right? I was down here at DC at GW. I, we just won the NIT. I was feeling really good about life. Um, and when I went to Morgan, it was like an oasis in the middle of Baltimore, right? So the, the first thing I'll say is us, those of us that work and have gone to HBCUs, we carry a burden or a mantle of responsibility to present our HBCUs in the right light. That's the first thing I'll say, because when I got to Morgan, we had 10 of our 14 teams facing a postseason ban. We were facing five years probation and a $60,000 fine. So most people thought I was crazy by taking that job, right? But I saw a diamond in the rough because the the president that we have is phenomenal and he was able to articulate a vision and present Morgan to me in a way that I could latch on to and help him carry out that vision. The other thing is this, HBCUs are some of the most diverse places you will ever be in your life. And so when we talk about diversity, people think about race and gender, but what about education, experience? You saw I had Arjun raise his hand, he's from the Middle East. At Morgan, we do some things better than Harvard. Now, Harvard does some things better than us, but we do some things better than Harvard. They ain't putting out as many African-American engineers as we are. They're not doing that, right? 22% of our population is non african american I'll put that up against a lot of schools in the country about diversity, true diversity in thought, right, in experience. Uh, and then the other thing is we have to stop comparing ourselves, and I think Jackie did a really good job of talking about this, comparing ourselves to PWIs. A PWI for me... <laughs> oh, amen, somebody. And that's my provost, by the way. We love her. <laughs> but a PWI for me was a good fit, right? I was self-motivated. I was able to navigate some things. I was resilient in ways that some of my peers weren't. And I'm saying this to this point. When I went in to play baseball at the University at Albany, I went in with six gentlemen, right? I was the only African-American on the entire team. I went in with six guys in my cohort, me and five others. When we graduated, only two of us walked across the stage, me and one white guy, right? So even the white guys who went to the PWI weren't prepared for it for what they were going to get into. There are some superstar players, frankly, that would benefit a heck of a lot more by going to an HBCU because of the support structure that is actually available and the nurturing that goes on at an HBCU. So I really think that individuals need to look at what's best for them and not what everybody tells you you should do because I took my first job, AD job, at 36 years old at an HBCU that had a lot of problems. And I can tell you now, we're looked at by the NCAA three years later, I'll be 40 tomorrow, we're looked at as a national model of excellence for limited resource institutions. Y'all still with me? While student athletes are on a full ride and playing their sport full time, sometimes they aren't able to maintain jobs or make any additional money. Many think the scholarship is enough, especially since many are only, uh, isn't enough, especially because it's just for one year. Any thoughts on the misconception that being given a full ride is enough? I will direct that to Coach Ham. In the first place, um, <clears throat> the one year perception is not true. And we've gotten totally away from focusing on education, and it's all the one and done. It's all the NBA first rounders. Now, you only have 450 NBA jobs, and about 150 of them going to European players. And every year, you only have 30, you have 60 spots, and you only have four lottery picks, I mean, 14 lottery picks, and we, we all talk about the one or two of the elite players, there aren't very many elite players around. There are very few elite players. You can, so, so 
we, we keep talking about the one and done and one out. That's not really the truth. And, and even the opportunities that are available are few. And, and, and so I, I want to clear that up. And we got to get away from uh, getting excited. Now, we have, whenever you have a situation, we have over close to 200 kids putting their name in the draft, and you only have 60 spots. And then you have 40 that keep their name in the draft that don't ever get drafted. So over a period of five or six years, you're going to have 25, you have 250, 300 kids with no degrees, no opportunities, and no jobs when there's not really that many opportunities available. So don't get me started on that. Let's talk about, let's talk about the, the financial thing. Now, the NCAA has done a real good job of, and, and, and schools that can afford it, they have uh, cost for attendance. Now, unfortunately, everybody can't afford to do that. But if you are a student at Florida State, and I'm sure I speak for a lot of schools that are at, at our, in our situation, you get a Pell Grant that's about, uh, I think one thing, um, my numbers might be a little off, maybe $7,600 for a Pell Grant. And every kid who financially falls in that category like I would have, have an opportunity to do that. Then you got to cost attendance. An out-of-state student at Florida State will, will, will get a scholarship that's worth with summer, spring, and, 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 and fall, it'll be a $50,000 a year scholarship. Over a four-year period, that's $200,000. He has an opportunity to get a Pell Grant, and he has a chance to get cost for attendance. That's $20,000. So that's $280,000 worth of education that a kid is getting while he's in school. Now, we paint this picture that the kids are not getting anything. That's not really true. But what is the value of education? What is the value of getting a degree and, and having a better way of life down the road for you, your kids? We, we seem to not be placing the value on what that really, really means. Now, the elite players need to have an opportunity to realize their dreams. That's God has blessed them, and we got to encourage them. But 99% of the athletes are like Leonard Hamilton. They have to work to get an education, and they're going to be in, in the workforce. So I think that is there's a lot more advantages that kids can take advantage of, excuse me, a lot more opportunities for the kids to take advantage of going to college, and they are not needing to go out and do as much work as people seem to think that they do. Anybody else want to respond to that? Uh, I would probably just add, you know, one of, one of the things that, uh, particularly as administrators at the uh, these institutions, um, the thing that I would always, always talk to the student athletes about, and that is, you got to understand uh, what you've signed up for, um, and 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 the problem uh, comes when, particularly in the sports of basketball and football, where they have blinders on and they come into the university thinking that they're just looking to use the university to get to the next level, to the professional level. Now, if they come in with that mentality and that's all they do, then they are going that the value of that degree or education is going to be diminished because they're not going to be getting a real education in act on the academic side. So what I would always say to my kids, I said, listen, you come here, you've got to make sure that you put as much into your academics as you put into your athletics. Because if you don't, then the scale is going to be imbalanced. And you're going to be doing yourself a disservice because your athletics ability is not going to be with you for the rest of your life. But your education is going to be there for the rest of your life. As a matter of fact, I would say to them, you should actually put even more into the academics than your athletics. Because then you're getting more out of this university than they're, from an academic perspective than this university is going to get out of you from an athletic perspective. So that was something that I always would tell them. And I would tell them because I experienced that. That was me. I was you at some point in time. My focus was I wanted to get to the NBA. And all I wanted to do was remain eligible. Get, make sure that I'm eligible to play and put as much as I can into trying to be the best basketball player I could. But then the light bulb comes on. You realize that the coach doesn't have you in their, in their mind to be the starter 
or that you're not going to get the, the the playing time that you want, and then you you, get, you wake up and you feel you realize that I'm at this preeminent institution that has great minds, that have great professors, and I haven't been taking advantage of it. You have to take advantage of all the academic offerings that a university has. You have to put yourself and immerse yourself into that. And if you do that, then you're getting an education and that degree and that education is going to just continue to escalate. You know, what I tell the kids at Florida State, you know, they used to be, what, 70 something? And we jumped into to 20 something now, it's in the top, uh, it's in the top 20 as far as institutions across the country. 18. 18th, public university. But still, the, the 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 value of that degree has increased. Not only for those who are currently there, but for those who went through Florida State. You, and and we lose out. Kids don't understand that. You have to make them understand that, and uh, it, they'll be much better for it when they go into deciding to take the collegiate route. Before we get to Mr. Fuller, if you have a question, you can start lining up at the microphone. Can I, can I add, like, so for the... For well, the one sec, we have oh, Mr. Fuller, sorry, and then, sorry, sorry. then no, you no, can no, respond. No, no. So, so I just, I, I agree with, with both Stan and, and Coach Hamilton, but the one thing that I think from a player's perspective that I want to bring up that I think would be helpful is if we could start, or if, if schools can start instituting financial literacy classes, mm -hmm. because, yeah, yeah. because I 100% I agree so for, for students that couldn't afford it, in addition to scholarships, they did get Pell Grants. And if I if I'm I didn't qualify for it, but if I'm not mistaken, it's 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 a check each semester, correct? And a lot of times what I vividly recall is that's more money than these students mm -hmm. have ever had yep. in their life. And the first thing that they do with it is spend it. Yep. And gold chains, gold fronts, tennis Glorious. shoes, what I don't know what they're spending on now, but essentially it's gone faster than it probably came. Yep. And, and then that's when the struggle comes for the remaining of the semester and the remaining of the year when students are trying to figure out what they're gonna do for food. It's because the portion of the money that they've been allocated from their Pell Grant has already been spent in the first two or three weeks. And I think any type of financial literacy from an early age, I mean, we need it in high school, but if we get to a college and, and we haven't had it, it would, it would benefit not only the people that are on Pell Grant and the, you know, the non-elite athletes, but also the elite athletes when they go to the NFL or the NBA or, or whatever you know, professional sports league there is, in order to kind of ease into having that amount of money to be able to you know, allocate it in the right way moving yep. forward. Yeah, I was just going to add, like, so as, as a member of the NCAA and as a conference, we all have the opportunity at our institutions or our conferences to provide those types of resources based on the funding that we receive and based on the toolkits that are provided from the NCAA. The CIAA, when we negotiate even our contracts with our sponsors, we put in there, we want internships and we want jobs, yeah. right? So you're us funding or you're going to invest into the, and we're going to be partners, but we also want you to invest in our student athletes. So then it's my job to make sure that we get our students in front of those sponsors or all the sponsors that we have in our career expo or individual leadership programs so that those kids could get jobs. And we have success with student athletes in our conference getting jobs at Coke. Food Lion, Nationwide, Toyota, and you name it. That's our job and responsibility to do, and every institution can do that. I, I just have to, with all due respect to what Stan has said, I, I've got to throw in something else, right? From the movie, we talked about this. But you know, when I was at University of North Carolina, um, I spoke with a lot of athletes. As a matter of fact, I had a very fortunate opportunity to sit down and do a focus group. I had about 30 athletes and across all sports. And I asked these kids, young people, excuse me. I asked them, I said, why did you choose to come to the University of North Carolina? This is about five, six years ago, right? And I said, but the one thing you can't do when you answer that question is tell me because it's a good school. Mm -hmm. I said, because every place you got recruited to told you it was a really good school. Isn't that right? And they said, absolutely. So I said, be honest with me. Tell me, why did you come to this school? Even down to the track athletes, right? People told me, particularly in football and basketball, because this is the best place to get me into the pros, right? So 
when we talk about athletes turning on the mind and saying, well, I got to take advantage of this educational opportunity, that's a counter message to all the messages they get about why you go to college sports in the first place. When Coach Harbaugh recruits and offers a scholarship to an eighth grader, right, that sends a message to that eighth grader that says, I'm anointed, I'm going to the pros. But it also sends a message to a whole bunch of other eighth graders around the country and say, you know what? What about me? Am I good enough? They got all of this anxiety. I got to now go out there and prove to the world, to the coaches, to recruit me so I can be good enough to play at your school so I can go to the NFL and the NBA. Right. So when I had a, a track athlete, a young white track athlete tell, say to me, they said, you know, the message that I received when I came here to North Carolina is that C's get degrees. Right. I would heard that from a bunch of football and basketball players across the country. But I was like, you're not going to go pro. Why would the university send that message to you? And they said, because you know what? I'm here to represent this university in running. Right. And to them, to him, he interpreted that was my education to these people at this university is second to how I can represent them on the track field. And that is the message that you say they have to interpret how important their education is, they're doing that through all of these other messages that told them you're the best thing since sliced bread is why you're on this campus in the first place. How does a young person reconcile that when they've been getting that message from the eighth grade? I don't do that. And that's a great thing. That's why I said culture at All coaches place don't do different. that. All coaches don't do that. Exactly. I'm, I'm honest with them. I, no, that's all I'm gonna say. No, no, and, and well, a follow up on what Leonard's saying. And, and Hold on, we have a response why. right here from uh, Mr. Oh, Rant, and then we'll I'm come sorry. back to you. And as a parent, I and then we'll take that. your questions. Yeah. See, we have, to be quite honest, you have parents, a, a part of that culture as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And as a parent, I didn't do that. I had a, a, I, both of my sons received scholarships to uh, college for basketball. One was an elite athlete, and my other son was uh, a, a mediocre. Well, God, I hope <laughs> we family, right? Right, but you know, he wasn't. He if he, he would have been committed earlier, he would have made it to the NBA. But his commitment started too late. But and so, but but I I impressed upon my sons the importance of of education, and I know the culture that you speak of was was there as well. But I was the biggest culture for my sons at that time, and I think that's what. Um, to help drive these, these children's mindset and to create a thought process within them is that it has to start at home. It just has to start at home. And then you partner with the coach, like Coach Ham, who will uh, partner with you and say, what your mama told you is right, and if you don't do what she told you, then you got to deal with me. And then I'm home rest of the shore. So I think everything that we said on this panel is true, but it, the, I think the, the basis of this really starts at home and we have to get back into to the the old way of thinking and teaching our children the old because it worked i turned out all right it worked for me it worked for most of us so it could work for our children and generations to come too sorry I just uh, yeah, all i would add is that's that's so true it's it really the culture starts at home and then when, when they move on to the collegiate level also, it's incumbent upon those who are doing the hiring of coaches that they are looking for coaches like Coach Ham who, are take, who understand and are caring about the total person and not just trying to get individuals that are coming there to go on to the professional ranks. So it, it, it really is having the right culture that's around those individuals as they're coming up as young young men and women, and then continuing to have that kind of culture at the university. Now, a lot of universities, some, some don't go that way. And that's why, when I said earlier, we've got to have more people that look like us in some of these roles, because we are concerned about our folks, and, uh, and that's, that's, what we have to, that's what we have to have. To everyone waiting to ask a question, I want you to first ask yourself, have they already answered my question? <laughs> Please introduce yourself. Keep your questions brief. No statements. Questions only. Direct your questions to at least one panelist. I'm Janetta Taylor, and I'm a youth basketball coach. And I'm going to follow up on what Mama Durant said. 
Um, one of the things I'm in the thick of right now, I've coached basketball for 15 years, and right now I'm focusing on girls basketball, I've coached hundreds of girls. Um, what we were saying about how do we build the desire to succeed given that the athletes today are not faced with the same generational expectations or difficulties. And I'm directing that towards Mama Durant. Your question again? I'm sorry. So the question is, how do we build a desire given, I'm sorry, how do we build a de desire to succeed given that athletes today are not faced with the same generational expectations and difficulties as we were talking about earlier? <clears throat> well, I think they still, they are still faced with the same difficulties and, and I think you have to continue to push them to be resilient, to be de determined, to be determined, to persevere. Um, I think the requirements for an athlete today is the requirements that the requirements of an athlete yesterday. So I think that's what builds up uh, their resilience to continue. Uh, but I do think they stick, they're they are faced with some of the same problems, and even more so with social media. Mm -hmm. um, and so you just have to continue to, to do what you're doing as a coach, um, and don't allow them to quit. And mm -hmm. Let them know that they, if they want to be successful, they're going to have to fight for it and work for it. And I have a segue to uh, that. No, we have to go. Have to move on to the next Can question because we have people behind okay. you. Okay. Thank you. That's what makes it tough. Mm -hmm. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Lauren Robinson. I graduated from UCLA. I was a Division One rower. Um, I completed my yeah UCLA. Um, I completed my master's at Northwestern, and I'm currently a law student at George Washington um, Law School. <laughs> Wow, I didn't expect an applause. Um, my question is, um, we've been talking a lot about the intersection between social media and also we talked a little bit about um, financial burdens. And there was a proposed um, California Senate bill that came out that may allow mm -hmm. college athletes, specifically in California, to earn endorsements or earn compensation based off their name, image, and likeness. So I was wondering is how do you feel, do you think that this new Senate bill will kind of change college athletics or trying to change the dynamics of recruiting or just your thoughts in general, and this can be open to anyone. I want to direct that question actually to Mr. Fuller, the attorney yeah, sure. on okay. the board, because I had a similar question about okay. trademarking your child's name early. Yeah. So before they start benefiting off, you know, these bigger brands, you know, can, can they first, uh, you know, solidify that for themselves? Sure. So, I mean, a, a quick answer is yes. I, like, okay. I think I think this this uh, proposed bill could be big, and the reason why is, and, and I consider myself to be pro player when it comes to a lot of things of this nature. I believe that college athletes should be able to be compensated for their name and their likeness and their image. Um, the The only issue that I can see that may come from it is there's only, as you know, Coach Hamilton was saying, there's only so many elite athletes yeah. that will actually be able to you know, benefit from that type of bill. Mm -hmm. And for the, the rest of the players on the basketball team or the, the football team that don't benefit from it, it's, it's going to cause, I think, larger and more significant issues in the mm -hmm. recruiting process, in, in the transfer process, yeah. in the recruiting process, and different things like that. But I think what shouldn't happen is that, and in, in, in I, I know Stan probably has uh, some some comments on this. What shouldn't happen is that the NCAA, the institutions shouldn't benefit financially from the talents of players mm -hmm. and the players themselves not benefit from those talents when mm -hmm. it comes to marketing and, yeah. and soliciting their services um, in, out there in the media. What value do you put on the quality of the education? What value do you put on the fact that if I'm getting $20,000 a year mm -hmm. and I'm in school and I'm getting the mentoring in, the mentorship, the tutoring, all the other things to go. We, we, we got to be careful about how we determine what's amateur and what's professional. Mm -hmm. And this is a process that we are going through. We can't make the progress unless we go through the process so these kids, and I, don't, I can't imagine 10 kids on, our, on Florida State's campus getting $10,000 a month and everybody else looking at them as to, as to why I'm left out of that. I just yeah. think that you're creating problems that, that and that the model has worked. Mm -hmm. Now, if, if we want to uh, find some way, it just needs a lot of dialogue. We need a lot of conversation about this because <laughs> you don't want to deprive elite people the opportunity. Mm -hmm. But when I look back at it, it's only been by elite of four or five images gone. Now, mm -hmm. what's going to happen is certain programs in America, every one of their players will be elite. 
So all 15 players at certain schools are going to get $20,000 a month. Mm -hmm. So now all the elite players going to these same schools. I mean, I think we need to have a lot of discussion. We need to think this thing through before we uh, let this cat out of the bag. You know well, what I mean? I, I agree. I, I think there will be some, some big issues. But, again, if, if that should happen in your example where, you know, certain players or certain schools – just took only the elite, and those elite players were able to capitalize. When I was at the University of Kentucky, I, I promise you, them. all 12 of our players at the University of Kentucky would be elite, would be elite players, mm -hmm. and every one of them would be idolized and get that. And the schools who don't have that opportunity would be get to get the second would not be would put at a disadvantage. And I'm just saying to you, what we've been doing is working. You know, it's not like it's not like getting your education doesn't have a value. And somehow or another, that's getting lost in the shuffle. You know, that we got to, everybody's not elite. Right, and, and for the people that aren't elite, that value, that education is huge, and it doesn't get lost in the shuffle because it still benefits those individuals. <laughs> and we are going All to right. continue this conversation <laughs> because things just got real. Do you so want we'll me to? Hi, Thank my, you. Na okay. my name is Yolanda Addison, and I actually went to Virginia Tech with Vincent. Um, when he was playing football, I was a student assistant in the sports information office and went on to work for three different teams within the NFL, also a consultant for the NFL, um, and have done some partnership work with the NFLPA and the Congressional Black Caucus PAC, which I'm running right now. Um, my question is directly related to this, and this gentleman let me skip, because um, when I was in high school, I studied this exact question of whether or not college athletes should be paid. And as a daughter of a student athlete who my dad promised my siblings and I that he, we would never go to school on a scholarship for athletics because he said it was slavery. That's how his experience was at Virginia Tech in the 70s. That's what he experienced. And so he said, for my kids, it's not going to happen. And so I came from it from that perspective. And so, but when I saw my friends in school not being able to have the same opportunities that I had to get a job, to make some extra money, and all of that kind of stuff, I wonder what the panel thinks, specifically the administrators, about the wonderful women like this young lady here, who is an Olympic level. You know, UCLA is that, that's not a that's not a small school, and so she's definitely probably an Olympic level athlete. But she doesn't have the same opportunities that Vincent Fuller had by being on a video game, and so her time. Now I understand what everybody's saying about you know the the value of an education, but her time that she's putting into her sport is just as many hours as Vincent and his friends put into their sport, and their sport brings in money and hers doesn't. So how do we equify, like how do we give her money so that she can walk around and not feel like a poor college student, and how do we let Vinny and his people and his friends and his teammates benefit from the work that they're actually doing and the money that's the dollars and the cents. Like, how do you make it equity? Because she's putting in 60 hours a week. He's putting in 60 hours a week. Neither one of them can go get a job at McDonald's. Mm -hmm. Mr. Wilcox, you want to touch that one? Yeah, I'm not quite sure I got it all, but I think I'll try to answer it. Well, uh, first of all, student athletes do have the right to uh, go and get jobs and work. I think where the, the problem or the issue com comes in is that sometimes you don't have the, the time to, uh, to, to work, uh, and, and that uh, based upon the time that you have. And this goes to the whole issue of, uh, that the NCA and member institutions struggle with all the time, and that is time demands of student athletes. You know, we were, there was a time when, you know, there were no limits on the number of hours you can practice or compete. Uh, and, and that was then changed over, over the years. And it's continued to change to make sure that we're giving more time back to student athletes so that they can have more of a, a life, a social life, and or be able to work if they want. But uh, particularly at the highest level, a lot of athletes, when they get more time back, they're in, they're, they end up still putting more time into practicing within their sport because they're, they, they, they want to be elite and they want to be better. But uh, I think your question also had to do with um, how do you kind of, um, I don't know. Well, it's basically if you're able to pay somebody who has 
who's getting money, like you're able to see the direct revenue line of like, okay, your likeness is on a video game. You get oh, X number right. of dollars per this video game. Right. But she's putting in the same amount of hours and there's no rowing video game right. that she can so, get a stream of revenue for. But so, she deserves to be that's not a real paid, in my opinion, right, so, as much as they did. So, so we're not there yet as far as, um, as far as legislation within the NCA being changed to allow for individuals to uh, earn money off of the name, image, and likeness. However, there is a there is a working group of the highest board of governors that that's currently looking at that issue. And and the only way I would answer your question is if if there was a way to uh, basically make sure that everybody's kind of all student athletes are getting a, a share or pay, it would have to be through a group license mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to individual license. And both individual license as well as group license are being considered under uh, under this group. And uh, you know, you just have to. It'll, Making legislation within the NCA is very similar to federal legislation. It's like watching sausage being made, mm -hmm. and it takes and it takes time. It's very bureaucratic, but uh, you know the 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 this SB bill in 206 in in California, you know they they maybe they may be on one spectrum one end of the spectrum. I, d I don't expect that uh, the NCA will go to that uh, end because that bill was originally basically named pay for play mm -hmm. bill and and collegiate the collegiate model is not about pay for play we're not professional mm -hmm. but we are about doing and finding the best things for our student athletes we're trying to make the student athlete experience the best it could possibly be not just from the highest level, but from the conference level as well as the institutional level. So it is being discussed. It, it, you, you know, you'll see some things probably in the future, but I, at this point in time, you can't really talk about. And this is definitely a conversation. Excuse yes. me, that will continue. We have another um, <clears throat> another panel in here right after this panel, so we have time for about two more questions before we bring the congressman up for closing remarks. I, 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 I'm sorry, I just got to jump in this real quick because the thing that really that I think gets lost in the conversation often because we focus so much on should athletes get paid or not. But I think there's a much more fundamental question that gets lost in this is it's a human rights issue. How in the world does an athlete when they're 18 years old sign a scholarship go on the college campus, and even those who don't sign scholarships, they just walk on campus and they, they try out and they're walk on. How is it all of a sudden that the NCAA has controls of their image and likeness? How did they lose control over that? And then without any representation, there's no college union, there's no one that ever asked the athletes, um, he, let's negotiate who controls or owns your image and likeness. They just, all of a sudden, because the NCAA made a rule, they get to determine who owns your image and likeness? I think fundamentally, if we were looking at that in a regular college student, when I decide that I'm gonna accept to go to George Washington or any university, whether I'm paying to go there or not, all of a sudden, the university owns your image and likeness, I think we'd have a huge revolt over that. Why are we talking about money when we're talking about a human rights issue? I should have the ability to own my own right, and if I want to negotiate it to give it over to you for some kind of financial remuneration, then that should be my right to do that. But the NCAA co-opted that and never asked anybody about it. This is fundamentally where we've missed the boat. Last question. This will be our last question. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Thomas Gadsden. Okay, last two, if y'all make it quick. I'm sorry, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> I run a uh, youth basketball program. You talk about mental health. You talk at the collegiate level. I see it at a much younger level. I see it at eight years old, nine years old, 10 years old. By the time it gets to you, it's, sometimes it's gone. It's too much for you to deal. You said you had a whole, you know, the number that you gave. I see it at eight, nine years old with kids have coming from a single parent home. I went to HBCU. That's all I knew. I wasn't going no place else. My mother said, no, that's it. Bottom line, see ya. How do you get that message over? How do you continuously get that message? It's, the message is, is getting lost in the sauce. Everything from the mental health piece to I'm going to make it, because genetics pays a large part of this as well. 
Um, I respect your question. We have discussed both those issues earlier in the conversation. Okay, so how do we get the message over? What message are you talking about? How do we get the message to the young kids on how, where you're going and where you are going, how you're going to get there? What is that message? What is that video? Because it's not just social media. Well, if, I, if I could just, you know, with, with, with what I do in my field, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's a lot of people who don't get to do the things that I've done. Mm -hmm. Just like the athletes, there, there are many elite athletes, there are as many elite actors if you want to make sure. a comparison. I think the message should be what they see. Mm -hmm. I, it's, it's unfortunate, and I'm sure a lot of us in here can uh, understand that we live in a world that has gone crazy. Yes. And it is driving us and our children crazy, and they feel that the only way out is financial. Right. And the only financial means that they can, uh, the only way to get the financial means that they think would get them out of whatever tumultuous life that they have is through athletics. Correct. Because they don't have the resources, like you said, uh, financial literacy classes and mm -hmm. courses and things like that. Um, uh, things that's going to show them what to do if you don't make it. Right. You know, but that, those hopes and dreams, you know, where you can see everything and everybody all the time, everywhere, all day, on all your screens, your phones, your tablets, your TVs, your computers, where they get this idea that I can do that too. And it's unfortunate that not everyone can do everything that everyone does, especially at an elite level. Right. As, a very, as, as, as Coach Ham said, there's a very small percentage of, of people who get to that place mm -hmm. where everyone can see the greatness that they're doing. I have a young man who just graduated, double major. I'm just sorry, got we five can't have any follow-ups. We have five minutes school. left. We have five minutes. I believe we have two students <laughs> behind you. Okay, this is our last question. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You look handsome. You do. You look good. You look good. Last question. My name is God the II. Um, I attend Virginia State University. I'm a member of our senior class office. My question is for you, Commissioner McWilliams. I'm going to make it quick. Um, first question, well, my question is, is there any way, my, the funds at my disposal are limited with my position. Is there any way, um, my vision is to bring a bus of Virginia, students, Virginia State University students down to the CIAA Career Fair um, because I got an internship there with Toyota last year. Um, so is there any way that you guys on your end can help me a fund that and two um, do you guys have any positions available on internship <laughs> or that is a great question give me your information before we leave and we can talk okay your president okay. is the chair of our board chance. okay thank you there so you we're going to start with him you gotta give him a chance. No, I, I we'll do it live. No, we'll he, 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 he had to get the bag. But um, you can answer this after. But I'm a rising medical student in Detroit, Michigan. Um, and I wanted to ask the panel um, kind of two parts. So student athletes are student athletes even before they get to university. Um, and what are some ways that we can start holding people accountable? Um, when you talk about the circuit, you talk about high schools. Yeah. I've encountered a lot as a former athlete. Yeah. I've encountered a lot of teachers who push people kind of through, knowing that, oh, you're going to be a division one athlete, you're going to go to the league, so what is the point of you coming to class? Like, I've had friends who've had to do that, so how can we start holding people accountable? Um, looking from the collegiate level, because that's essentially um, that midway, that transition between going to professionals. So how can we start holding people accountable um, and providing resources for that 99% who aren't going to make it to the league? Um, but you can answer that outside, because I know you got to you gotta close up. That's a good question, bro. It's a good question. Hey, Georgia. Can I, can I just cl clarify something with the NCAA? As we always say, the NCAA. Do you know who the NCAA is? That's a question that you need to know. The NCAA, there's three parts. So keep this as you're thinking about your questions and you're thinking about your rebuttals and you're thinking about what we don't do as an organization. I am the NCAA as a member of the NCAA. CIAA, all these schools represented are members of the NCAA. Stan is a member of the NCAA staff. I am a member of the NCAA, and then I am a member on an association that helps Stan do what I've asked him to do, right? So when you talk about likeness and who's talking about it, I am with other members of the association and membership so that the NCAA can follow what we've asked them to do. There's a lot of work that has to be done on everything that everybody has said today. But that's our responsibility as members of the association so that the staff can do the work that we've asked them to do. That's how the process goes. That's why he said the process is like watching whatever you want to call it, making cookies, right? There's a lot of layers to it that has to happen. So I really think it's important 
that you understand who the NCAA is, who's making decisions, and who is making, who can influence the decision, right? We have a staff here that are part of a lobbyist group that are staying on top of gender equity, Title IX, mental health, sexual awareness, all that stuff. It's just not this stuff we're talking about. The NCAA is a larger piece of higher education that has given us all an opportunity to play the games that we love and still get a degree and be doctors and commissioners. Ain't that awesome? And actors. Wow. So look, we have to leave the room. We have to leave the room. You can ask after. You can ask after the event. Uh, we have another e event in here at 4 o'clock, and we have to leave the room. So thank you all for being here today. I'm going to ask the congressman to come back up for final remarks. Again, my name is Georgia Dawkins, and you can follow me at Georgia Dawkins on social media and purchase my book, Everybody Knows, The Power of Being in Position, on Amazon. Thank you. Thanks, uh, thank you very much, and I want to thank uh, our panel, uh, which is a great panel, and I, I know when I start getting involved uh, with uh, the NCA and all of the questions of my college athletes because I was a part of it, uh, uh, it just never stops. And uh, I was just wanted to say one thing. I have a college official here, Isitrum, who uh, uh, officiates in uh, ACC, SEC, uh, MEAC. And uh, one of the things he told me some time ago is that one of the biggest issues that, we, that the officials are faced with is mental health issues, which the coaches are not able to tell them about. But they're up and down the court uh, with athletes, and they see a whole lot of uh, different things. Again, I want to congratulate you. I filed a bill to get rid of the one and done, which I've had a uh, conversation with uh, uh, Mr. Wilcox and also with Coach Hamilton. Uh, and some issues around that I might not really understand, but my concern was uh, in filing that bill is that universities spend so much money on recruiting uh, some of the elite athletes, and they only stay one year. And so it, it's, uh, it, it's, it's really competitive uh, out there, and all the institution is going to go after the, uh, the top one or two or three, four or five players. And they spend hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, and then you wonder whether it's really fair. Uh, shall the NCA look at it the way they look at it, uh, uh, Mr. Wilcox, in baseball? You know, uh, and so, and that's one of the things I know that eventually they're going to make a rule on. And it's one of the things that is talked about around Congress a great deal. Or some of my colleagues out in California and different places about getting rid of it. Uh, so, uh, but the whole issue is we, we had an outstanding panel. Uh, we really happy. I see that I'm going to have to continue to work on this area. For those of you who wanted to ask other questions, you know, I apologize. Uh, uh, maybe we can find a way to do it a little bit better so you can get a lot of the question in. But let's give the panel uh, an applause. Uh, thank you very much, and we look forward to continuing to work with you.